Now, um, we're going to talk about autism. And the reason I even, there's always an interesting story behind most of the um, topics that I talk about here. So the little backstory behind this, and I really, really am sorry to the person who emailed me about this because I'm not talking about the specific topic that he wanted to me, wanted me to. It was about autism and police, and whether or not police officers are trained to be able to uh, work well in even a crisis or semi-crisis situation with someone who is autistic. And I am sorry. I'm not talking about that today, but let's start with the basics is how I view it for us today. Um, my guest is Christine Lindgren. She is the director, executive director. Is that, would, be, would that be a good title? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the organization is called Responding to Autism, and they work with parents and other folks in our community, and we will learn more about the organization. Plus, we have Natalie Cobb, who is also our guest, and Natalie is a parent, and she has twin boys who have been diagnosed with autism. So welcome to both of you. So nice to have you here today. Thanks for having us. Um, so let's start, Christine, with um, what is autism and what isn't it? And you know, we mostly get our view of these types of things from movies and television and all, but help us understand what it is and what it isn't. Sure. Autism is a pervasive developmental neurological disorder that affects a child's entire development. Um, the diagnostic criteria for autism is difficulties in social interaction, a delay in uh, verbal and nonverbal communication, and um, repetitive behaviors and fixated interests. So um, what autism is not, is it's not a behavior disorder. It's not a, a speech disorder. Um, it's a very pervasive disorder that can affect a child in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So can someone have um, normal uh, intelligence and have autism? They sure can. Autism, the word spectrum is used, autism spectrum disorder. And with spectrum, it means that there's um, different characteristics, okay? So a person on the autism spectrum can be very high functioning and have very high intelligence um, and have mild um, symptoms and characteristics. Or a person on the spectrum could be uh, moderate to um, very high needs mm -hmm. and have limited verbal and um, their um, cognitive and intellectual abilities can also be affected. Mm -hmm. Natalie, how old are your sons? They are 12. 12 years old, okay. So when did you first see that something you maybe thought wasn't right? We had um, a standard checkup at 18 months where they actually used what is called an MCHAT. And it's something that most pediatricians and things will use to look for potential um, likelihood of something like autism that may be going on. Um, my kids did have some delays, but they were a little bit premature because they were twins. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was kind of always just, oh, they'll catch up, they'll catch up, they'll catch up. And when we had that MCHAT done at 18 months, um, we were referred to get further screening and testing for autism because it was suspected at that time, but there weren't really a lot of answers as to whether or not that was what was going on. Mm -hmm. Well, what were they doing? What 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 was what was an eighteen month old child not doing, or doing too much of, or you know, I don't I don't you gotta paint right, this picture right. for me. I know nothing. <laughs> so, with my twins, um, you know, it affected them so differently that it was kind of difficult for me to even look at it that the same thing could be going on. Um, one of them was quite delayed in, in a lot of things, a lot of the developmental milestones that you look at, you know, even using his hands and being able to pick up toys, um, just some of the motor planning and learning to sit up, um, walk, different things. And that didn't necessarily all relate to autism, but it brought red flags. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, it happened a little bit later in development, around two. Um, he seemed to be, for the most part, developing normally, and then it just kind of really fell off. Um, a lot of words that he had initially learned and some of the skills that he had initially used, he got very withdrawn, um, a lot of meltdowns, crying, difficulty being in you know unpredictable situations, 
didn't like to be touched, would just sit in the corner for hours, and it was suddenly almost like a different child. So it was very different for each of them. Wow. Yes. Uh, um, are they fraternal or identical? They're fraternal twins. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what do we know about the causes of autism? Um, you know, we know more than we did five years ago. Mm -hmm. We know that they um, they have identified specific genes associated with autism. Um, we know that um, the probability is high that there may be an environment to trigger at some point, um, either in utero, utero or during development, that uh, may um, trigger autism um, for children that might be predisposed to having it. But other than that, Christine, um, we don't know specifically what the cause is. We know that there's not one single cause, that there's probably a multi multitude of things that uh, may be causing autism. Um, but I'm encouraged by the amount of research that's being done that hopefully um, someday soon we will know that cause. Mm -hmm. And so how frequent is uh, autism uh, in births and children? Um, the CDC has it down as one in 68 children um, and one in 42 boys. It's much more prevalent um, with boys than it is with girls. Mm -hmm. And there was actually a, a government study done in November um, of this year that was a, a parent survey and it actually had autism down to as low as uh, 1 in 150. Mm -hmm. But right now the CDC um, number of 1 in 168 is what stands. So how does that compare 1 in 68 to, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? What Give us some, is it increasing, decreasing, staying the same? We just are better at identifying it? What do we, what do we know about that? Um, it's very much increased. Um, just in uh, 2007 and 8 and 9, it was um, 1 in 500, then it was 1 in 250, then it was 1 in 110, and now it's 1 in 68. And so there's Whoa. certainly a, a prevalence of it yeah. is increasing by far. Um, as far as the reason why, and I actually get asked that a lot. Um, yeah. Why is there such an increase? Um, and I think there's a combination of things. Um, definitely more awareness. Um, parents are more aware of the signs to look for. Um, pediatricians are more aware to screen earlier, so I think it's kind of getting caught more, a lot more earlier. And um, I think that there's probably some aspect of, again, an environmental trigger. Um, we don't know what that is that might um, be related to the prevalence. Um, and then again, better screening, schools being more involved as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Natalie, how many other children do you have? Do you have any? I do not. Oh, okay. All right. I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break here, uh, but when we come back, I want to talk with you and Christine about how um, having a child diagnosed with autism affects the family. We're back in a moment here on Meet in the Middle. We're learning about autism today on Meet in the Middle. My guest is Christine Lindgren. She is the director of Responding to Autism, a local organization here. Also, Natalie Cobb, who is the parent of twin 12-year-old boys who have been diagnosed with autism. So as we went to that break, I mentioned that I want to talk about how having a special needs child or a child with autism affects the family. Christine, what has been your experience with that? Um, autism definitely affects um, the entire family. Um, having a child with special needs will put um, a lot of stress on uh, relationships, on um, not only the, the marriage of the parents as well as uh, sibling relationships, um, stress on a lot of finances. Um, it can The fact that they have to really prioritize the child's pervasive amount of needs. They have to shift a lot of their resources and attention on getting the treatment and the support that's needed for a child on the autism spectrum. Um, it can affect the family's um, unit um, by far. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times um, marriages um, often don't survive. Unfortunately, yeah, that is unfortunate and I have read that as well. Natalie, so talk with us a little bit about your situation when you first, you were telling us during the break that when you first learned that your boys might have autism, you wanted to move. Why was that? We were living in Utah at the time and I quickly found out that there was a serious lack of resources where I was living. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I looked it up online to see anything related to the word autism where I was living in, and there just wasn't anything. Um, and our pediatrician actually 
had said, you know, to be honest, there's no programs here um, as of right now. So um, I was terrified and I thought, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, because the word autism, in my brain at that time, I had so little understanding and it was kind of this stereotype thought of what it was and it had instilled so much fear in me that I just felt helpless. Um, and we had an opportunity to relocate to this area and I had a friend that lived here and said, this is where you need to be because there's a lot of resources here. Um, mm -hmm. Her son also had had some delays and things and she had accessed a lot of great things here in the Tri-Cities. And so we upped and moved. You say we? Who's we? My husband and I. Mm -hmm. um, we packed up the back of the trailer. We got a temporary job offer here in the Tri-Cities. Um, and we just relocated and started over. Mm -hmm. um, where is the father today? He passed away about eight years ago. Yeah. Wow. So you have twin boys that you care for. Do you work? I do. Outside the home? I do. Whoa, so how do you do all that? How do you juggle all that? Where's the help that you get here? You know, um, we have been very blessed in getting access to a lot of community resources. Um, I was put in contact with all the right people at the right times early on. Um, I know there's a lot of families out there that haven't had that same um, access and ability to find out how to get help or where to get it. Um, but, you know, it was a, it was a slow process. Um, I went back to school, was doing school online, started working part-time. I have a huge support system. Um, we have a lot of friends and just a network of people here in the Tri-Cities that a lot of them are connected to the autism community. Um, and we just make it work. Um, and we've been very blessed. You have a very positive <laughs> spirit, Natalie. Thanks. It's uh, great to hear that. Um, so what would be the very first phone call, Christine? What, where do you think that people in our community, what should be their first phone call? Um, if they suspect that their child um, has autism, um, I think the first phone call is to the pediatrician, um, to go to their pediatrician to have their child screened. Um, most pediatricians, especially in our area, do have screenings so that they can do that initial um, likelihood. Um, once the screen has been done, if there is a likelihood of autism, then they can come to the Responding to Autism Center where we kind of do a further, uh, more specific screening um, towards autism spectrum disorder. And then immediately can begin to provide them support as well as refer them out um, if it's appropriate for medical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But initially, I think just um, their child possibly having autism can immediately put that stress on the family and a stress, stress on a mom and a dad. And so I think coming and immediately receiving support and knowledge um, knowledge will definitely help with the anxiety of that scary word of autism. Um, it's not the autism from the movies that you kind of mentioned earlier, Christine, mm -hmm. a child necessarily rocking in a corner or a rain man, but um, we learn so much more about autism and how it affects the brain and so many um, amazing interventions out there that can make a, a huge difference in a child's and family's life. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Natalie, tell us a little bit about some of the support that comes through uh, responding to autism as an organization. You as a parent, what have you gotten from that organization? Well, you know, like Christine mentioned, one of the really um, important things that parents need is to be empowered through knowledge and better understand what autism is mm -hmm. and figure out how they fit into that really broad um, idea of autism. I think initially parents can feel really overwhelmed because they read things online or they've seen movies and, and that doesn't quite fit what they're going through and so then they start to feel even more isolated because they don't feel like they fit into that world. Um, so going to the center and getting involved in parent support groups, um, attending you know uh, trainings that teach you more about autism and help you understand how it better applies to your child and your family can be very empowering in helping you to kind of get over that hump of feeling so buried and so overwhelmed and really see how it applies to you and what you can do so you can slow down, take a breath, and start taking steps towards making progress. What is school like for your uh, twins at 12 years old? Uh, my twins are actually homeschooled. Oh my um, gosh. <laughs> 
Wow. And they, they do very, very wonderful in the homeschool environment. Mm -hmm. um, it works for our family. It doesn't work for every family. It doesn't work for every child. Right. But for my kids, that became the appropriate fit. Um, they're both very, very intelligent. And I think the difficulty was um, there were areas of learning in school that they couldn't keep up. And there were areas of learning in school where they were really far ahead. And kind of just like any child, um, if you're sitting in a classroom with 30 kids and you know some of them are all learning kind of from the same textbook, the same concept, and if your child is completely lost and has no idea what they're explaining, they're just sitting there mm -hmm. and they're not accomplishing a lot. Um, at the same time, if it, everybody's learning something that they've already learned far beyond that, um, they're just sitting there. And so there were a lot of, you know, times that I realized that they weren't quite keeping up with where they needed to be in some ways and a lot of times it just had to be that they had to learn it a different way yeah. and it's not realistic in a classroom all the time for a teacher to have the time to stop and try to explain something different to every kid um, and so for us it just worked to kind of pull back and spend more time on the things that they needed to have explained in other ways and less time on the things that were really coming natural to them. Well, they sound very lucky to be living in your home. That's for certain, Natalie. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, it seems that our culture, our society has this system down pretty well right now in terms of early diagnosis, and we're, we're pretty well set up for that. We have a lot of program, not a lot, but we have programs for people, education. We have public school. But then what happens when that child is 21? You know, public school education and the, the willingness of school and the legal authority to continue to provide service, that ends at age 21. What is the future for someone who doesn't totally fit in? I mean, yeah. Um, I, you know, it's very individualized, as yes. autism is very unique. And so for those um, adults that are um, high-functioning autism, um, there are some wonderful agencies here in our community that um, work towards kind of giving them those abilities, understanding autism and the fact that what are some of the obstacles they may deal with to become successful in employment. And so um, the center works with a lot of those agencies. Um, and we have a very rich um, adult support and uh, learning program so that we can help those adults with autism after they leave school to become successful. But something that we really, really want to, we talk to schools about as well as, of course, parents, is starting that transition early. Not waiting until they're um, 21 and mm -hmm. now it's like, well, now what? But beginning as early as 14, 15, and you're going to work on those kind of life skills to help them when it's time to transition. I'm sure that parents are thinking that, actually. I, when What is my adult child going to be doing? We're pretty much out of time right now, but I have really enjoyed learning about what is available in our community, knowing from Natalie that we do have services here. Responding to autism, that should be your first place to go and look for help and information. Christine and Natalie, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you I for appreciate having it. Us. We're back in a moment.